Welcome to the Essential Biomechanics Podcast. This is your place to listen to the most important topics in orthodontic biomechanics. Let's get started with your host, Professor Gustavo Gamero. Hello everyone, I'm Gustavo Gamero, and it's my pleasure to share with you my first podcast about the book, The Ten Fundamental Concepts of Biomechanics. Basically, I would say that the concepts presented in this ebook, which you can download for free from my website or social medias, constitute the foundations of our clinical practice. If you apply the knowledge of scientific biomechanics in your clinical routine, the quality of your treatments will improve and you will work much more efficiently. Today, we will discuss the fundament number one. There is only one drug of choice for tooth movement, and it is called force system. The orthodontic force and its attributes. In medical treatments, doctors have to decide among thousands of drugs to achieve the best results. In orthodontics, we have only one available drug, the orthodontic force. However, we need to control the dosage of this drug in order to get the desirable dental movements. Force magnitude, direction, and point of application are some variables that must be manipulated to achieve an efficient treatment. The most important parameter of all is the line of action of force, which in this case can be easily visualized by the spring itself. The force magnitude will depend on the characteristic of the appliance we use. They can be springs, elastics, wires, or any agent capable of applying a mechanical stimulus to the teeth. The point of application represents the point of contact of our appliance with the tooth to be moved. Whenever possible, this decision is made by the professional. Optimal force values. The search for the ideal force. The classic concept of optimal force was proposed by Schwarz in 1932, when describing that the optimal force would be the one capable of altering tissue pressure without occluding the blood vessels of the periodontal ligament. According to him, forces below this level would not induce tooth movement, whereas forces above this level would provoke areas of tissues necrosis which would hamper movement until undermining resorption removes necrotic tissues. Considering the biological aspect, we have three zones of force values, with distinct cellular and clinical response. In the inoculous zones, we have very low forces, with no movement at all. In the optimal zone, we have the maximum movement with minimal damage. These would be considered light forces. And in the heavy zone, we have the heavy forces, which will probably cause vascular occlusion, hyalinization, and greater risk of roof resorption. Theoretically, the term light is used for forces that are within the optimal zone range. However, it's very difficult to establish the real numerical difference between a light and a heavy force in the clinical practice. For example, If we apply a force considered light, such as 25 grams, in a smoother and homogeneous alveolar ligament bone interface, this force will probably not cause much damage and tissue strains, being therefore considered light from the biological aspect. However, if the same force is applied in a more irregular and roof ligament bone interface, for example, the tissue strains will be larger leading this force to be considered heavy in this situation. Inter-individual difference, optimal individualized values. It's necessary to understand that the impact of force magnitude on tissue response depends on a number of factors, such as type of movement, roof size and morphology, support tissue conditions, local cell population, and the ability of cellular response to adapt to these stimuli. These are the main factors that explain the enormous individual difference we observe in clinical practice, such as varied pain response, degree of mobility, speed of movement, and roof resorption risks. The inter-individual difference are more important than the magnitude of the force. Take, for example, this classic study on dogs. 
This research evaluated the influence of several magnitudes of force on the amount of dental movement. In dog one, for example, doubling the force did not change the amount of movement. In dog two, the tooth movement obtained was the same even with the force being increased four times. Also notice in this graphic the enormous difference of movement observed between dogs 1 and 2 independently of the intensity of the applied force. The take-home message here is the inter-individual differences are more important than the magnitude of the force. Force's line of action, the supremacy of this parameter. A professor once taught me that the orthodontist should act as a line of action hunter. I really appreciate this analogy, because this is actually what we do whenever we want to perform a controlled tooth movement. In order to predict the resultant tooth movement of any appliance, one of the first questions we should ask ourselves is, which line of action would induce the movement I want to achieve? For example, let's suppose we select three distinct application points, which also establish three different lines of force action in this particular case. Do you think the resulting movements would be similar? The answer is obviously no. Since we have three different lines of force in each situation, represented by blue, red, and green coils, we can certainly predict three distinct dental movements according to the chosen line of action. With the blue coil, we would have a tipping movement in which the crown would move more than the roof, and the tooth would undergo slight intrusion. With the red coil, the tooth would move with minimal change of its long axis and without significant change in the vertical direction. With the green coil, we would cause slight extrusion and greater roof movement. The law of transmissibility. In short, the law of transmissibility states that distinct points of application along the same line of action of force provoke exactly the same effects. For example, if instead of inserting your spring directly into the bracket, figure A, you decide to create an appliance configuration to apply the force at a point ahead the previous one, but in the same line of action, as in figure B. Your movement will essentially be the same. We can analyze the inclination of the force's line of action in relation to some reference plane. If our reference is the occlusal plane, for example, we will see that the line of action of the force lies at 40 degrees of it in both situations A and B. This angle can be called the angle of incidence of the force. Thanks for listening my podcast. I hope you enjoyed this journey into the 10 fundamental concepts of biomechanics. If you know the importance of these concepts to your clinical practice, join us next week for the episode number two about the center of resistance. Follow me on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, and keep updated on new posts. Thanks again, and see you next time.